In this series of tutorials, we will look at how glucose is metabolized to make energy in cells. Let's start with a bit of basic chemistry and talk about covalent chemical bonds. A covalent chemical bond is formed when two atoms, each of which has an unpaired electron in orbit around its nucleus, share their electrons with each other. The electrons are now paired, which is the state electrons prefer to be in and occupy an orbit that surrounds both nuclei. At the top of the diagram on this slide we have two atoms, each with an unpaired electron. In the lower half of the diagram, the two atoms have formed a covalent chemical bond with each other, and the two electrons are orbiting around both nuclei. In most cases, energy is required to form a covalent chemical bond. Why is this? Well, Electrons, which are negatively charged, will repel each other. In order for two electrons to stay in orbit around the nuclei, they must get further away from each other. This usually means they must climb further away from the nuclei. But because nuclei are positively charged, electrons and nuclei attract each other. The further an electron is from the nucleus, the more energy it must have to overcome this attractive force. Therefore, for the electrons to get further away from the nuclei, they must have more energy, and so energy must be put into the system. This is a rather simplistic explanation, but it is sufficient for our purposes. The bottom line is that to form a covalent bond, energy is required. So, where does this energy to form covalent bonds come from? Well, if it takes energy to form a covalent bond, it's reasonable to assume that breaking a covalent bond leads to a release of energy. If a covalent bond is broken, the now unpaired electrons don't have to be as far away from the nucleus as they were when they were paired with another electron in the bond. Therefore, they need less energy, and this excess energy can be released. So, when a covalent bond is broken, the unneeded energy is released and can be used in the formation of a different covalent bond. So the energy required to form one covalent bond comes from breaking another covalent bond. The molecule most often used in cells as a source of energy for covalent bond formation is adenosine triphosphate or ATP. ATP consists of an adenine group outlined by a blue box in the diagram, joined to a 5-carbon sugar ribose group outlined by a green box in the diagram, which in turn is joined to three phosphate groups, each group separated by red lines in the diagram. In particular, it is the high energy bond between the second and third phosphate groups, marked by the arrow in the diagram, which is most often hydrolyzed to release energy. ATP, however, is a very unstable molecule and breaks down spontaneously at a very fast rate. This instability makes it great as a source of energy in cells. However, it also means it must be synthesized very close to the site where it is going to be used. This means you can't just eat ATP as it would all be broken down before it reached its site of action in the cells. This problem is overcome by synthesizing ATP inside cells only when it's required, using the energy contained in chemical bonds in certain more stable energy-rich molecules that we consume in our diet, such as the carbohydrates and fatty acids. Amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, can also be used to synthesize ATP in cells, usually when carbohydrates and fatty acids are scarce, for example, during starvation. As an aside, ATP is not just important as a source of energy. It's a building block in the synthesis of DNA and a variety of other biologically important molecules and it's also involved in controlling metabolic activity in cells in various ways. So ATP is a key molecule in biochemistry. 
In the tutorials that follow, we will look at the pathway by which energy is extracted from the chemical bonds in the carbohydrate molecule glucose to make ATP. At first glance, this is a long and convoluted pathway, but it can be divided into three major stages. The first stage is glycolysis. The next stage includes the formation of a molecule called acetyl-CoA and also the citric acid cycle. Finally comes the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. The good news is that the metabolism of most of the other molecules you will come across in biochemistry and cell biology often feed into this pathway at some point. Therefore, once you have a basic grasp of the pathway by which glucose is metabolized in cells, you are halfway to knowing the metabolic pathways of many other molecules as well. Finally, two terms you may come across are catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism is the breaking down of complex molecules into simpler ones, often for the purposes of extracting energy from the chemical bonds of the complex molecules. The pathway by which energy is extracted from the chemical bonds in the carbohydrate molecule glucose to make ATP that we are going to look at in the tutorials that follow are a good example of catabolism. Anabolism, on the other hand, is the building up of simple molecules and atoms into more complex ones. So protein synthesis from amino acids is an example of anabolism. Anabolic steroids are so called because one of their major functions is to stimulate the synthesis of protein in muscle and so make the muscles big and strong. Now see how well you understand the material in this tutorial by taking the quiz. If you're viewing on the website, the quiz is on this page. If you're viewing on a video sharing site such as YouTube, you'll find a link to the quiz in the video description box.